welcome teenies new and old to wits and crits a round table q and i st- q and i q and a i speak word money good q and a style podcast hosted by me your <laughs> dice goblin and resident vanilla guard boy love and ship gremlin hayden davio i'm the player for aviana kolesh regan alis and fianula ioni for those of you who are just finding us for the first time hello hi we are nat 19 we are a group of actors performers and improvisers who've come together through our general love of storytelling and mutual nerdery today i have the one the only the beautiful the wonderful Logan Laidlaw, go ahead and introduce uh, hello. yourself. Eh, I jumped in too quickly. It's me. <laughs> Hi, it's me. I'm. I do not have nearly as much energy as Hayden <laughs> has managed to manifest on this day, but it's me. I'm here. Uh, should I? Do I? This is the part where I say what I do. This is where you say what you do. Okay. Who you be? Okay. Up, boy? Uh, I'm. A, I don't know how in depth everybody got on these nah. things. I'm. Uh, you people watching the channel will mostly know me. I should think by now. You should have some inclination nah. of who I am. But for those that are finding this as your first video, you you strange people welcome uh i'm logan laidlaw i am a voice actor i am the uh creative director for nat 19 um i am the one who made the setting we play in i run two of our games vestige of a fucus and dms as well as have run a lot of our other games that are finished uh, and I am also the project coordinator, lead writer, and a bunch of... Uh, I'm all the hats on Project Mouthwash. And I'm a lover of, of the capybara. As you can see, I'm a capybara boy. Look at this little guy. Look at that capybara He's keeping boy. me strong. <laughs> he's, he's your energy today. He's the one his, asking the questions. <laughs> he's puppeteering you. His name's Herbal. Is the... Uh, that's cute. That's canon now. Put that. On I the decided wiki. his name's Herbal. <laughs> Put that on the wiki. Which it. is both like a nice tea joke, but also a garbled way to say Red Bull. <laughs> I love it. How would you spell that? <laughs> I was just thinking about that, and I'm kind of upset you asked me before I decided. So because it's like a garbled, like fucking, this is Herber. Fucking is like, uh, E R. So how would this be? So this would be like. Herber, herbal, uh, E R B L E L herbal. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down, guys. This, this is the content y'all came for. <laughs> or E R B E R R herber. Herber, herber the baby. Oh, jeez. This is today. I am this mad is about today. it. All right, so how this works, Logan and Ann, since you haven't watched my other episodes, apparently. I, I meant to. It's fine, I understand. I The only reason I've watched them back is because I have to. Uh, so how this <laughs> works is I have two little, little click clacks here. Uh, I have a D4, which I will roll to determine who the question is for. Uh, so I'll be... Either be you, me, or both of us. And then I've got a beautiful little d12 here that I will roll to determine which question. But, you know, sometimes the dice don't matter and I decide a different question's more interesting to ask at that given time. If you roll a nat one, unlike <laughs> any of these, do I become the host? I mean, if you want, I'll just send you the Google Doc. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's, t- let's tempt fate. On, that, on a nat one, I'm the host. All right, let's go. I'm fine with this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna move the reactives around because that sounds like extra work that I don't feel like doing right now. <laughs> I would, I wouldn't expect. <laughs> I'm like, no, I sized everything out. All right, let me roll a d4. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. So welcome to Wits and Crits. I'll be your host, Logan Laidlaw. <laughs> no, don't, don't worry about oh it. Oh my it's, god. That's this is free so space. Funny. Don't no, worry. I'm not gonna do number one because that would be asking myself a question right out the gate, and I don't want to do that. Ah, I see. All right, cool. So it's gonna be for both of us. All right, all right, all right. For both. For both. Yeah. All right. So okay, okay, okay. This is a Regan and Aji side question. Oh right. I'm also Ajisai. I am a player in one game. <laughs> you do. You you get to play sometimes. That's right. They're they're mostly the pictures on the wall behind me. Yeah. Many a couple of them are 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 Miguel Ajisai. So that's also part of who I am. Yeah. You can't see I don't remember what the one behind you is. 
You know, I'm gonna... uh, I, I see a bunch of Fio. I see Rory and Avi. I see Fierna and Hathoyura Kolesh. And then I see uh, an Ajisai and Regan kissing, and that's just like the star of the show. And then I also see a Hot Spring Scandal, which if you didn't have that there for me, I'd be genuinely upset. So no, good. I listen. I know you. You know, I'm gonna briefly, like, oh, the, <gasps> the one behind you is fucking Tag and Avi, but that's fine. <clears throat> there, you're back. I held my breath so I disappear. I, I briefly chucked you into a bag of holding. Are you good? Was there, enough, okay. was there enough air in there? I had to There's... kind of get into a ball, but it was like pretty relatively spacious cool. inside. I'm glad. Cool. Well, anyway, so I got a question. Okay. At this point in the campaign, how do Regan and Ajisai feel about their other party members, and what are their theor theories on the whole elemental cult thing? Also, what is Ajisai's plan for meeting the parents, aside from giving them pickles? Oh. Uh, so that was three questions. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so what is sorry? So, so this is for both of us. Yes, it's for both Ultimately. of us. But you can definitely start us off. So uh, uh, at this point, uh, how do Regan and Ajisai feel about the party members? We'll start there because okay. it's also asking what are our theories about the elemental cults, which I have some, but mostly I'm gonna be like, no, you ask answer questions, sir guest. Okay, so in. Circa, what do they feel about other party members? Uh, Ajisai's brain is big enough to hold two thoughts at any given time. <laughs> so their opinions on people tend to boil down to roughly that amount of information. Uh, so, systematically, Casper, good. Casper, good. Casper, throw it problem. Casper, solve problem, fun way. <laughs> Uh, Ajisai very much enjoys Casper, even thinks that they're genuinely, like, the best thing that's happened to the party, because every time they have a dumb idea, Casper is fully on board to be like, yeah, that sounds good! And that is just not, that's not a good energy to have around Ajisai, but it's one that Ajisai very much enjoys. Um, so, Casper is great, and had been very welcome, and they, they very they're... much get along. Their dynamic's so funny to watch, but it is also the bane of Regan, Regan's existence. <laughs> She's like, oh my god. They really wind each other into <laughs> bad energy that's not helpful sometimes. Um, Circa Krusk. Ajisai likes bothering Krusk. Good. That's the correct Krus answer. They... They would probably like them a lot more if they used their magical musical playing talents to aid in their combat more, but they seem to have a weird hill they want to die on where they don't want to <laughs> give Ajisai inspiration, as it were. So, um, there's the a degree. Uh, the, but they find Krusk to be, um, they find Krusk to be fun, uh, a lot of the party members, because Ajisai is not used to dealing with a lot of people at once, there is kind of a vibe of, like, if I don't have a strong opinion on somebody, I kind of... They're just sort of just scenery. Mm -hmm. uh, and Krusk almost falls into scenery. Like, his drug stuff doesn't affect Ajisai at all. Like, everyone else has opinions on it, and she's just very like, I don't know, man, fucking... Whenever he's doing... What? Like, mushrooms? Whatever. He's having a good time. Uh, and he doesn't... Ajisai doesn't really get... So the like more intricate social paradigms that mm -hmm. Krusk is involved with. Not that I'm calling Krusk's social life complicated, <laughs> but like everything in the city is just so far beyond her. Everything in Waterdeep that she just doesn't fully understand the nature of his relationship to people in Waterdeep and doesn't care. Um, Kyra is unfortunately hi Eric if you're listening. Oh no. Um, is they they care for them the least in the party uh, because Kyra is constantly a downer and full of sidetracking and <laughs> just generally just not about fun but and always seems to be upset at everybody for doing the things everybody agreed to do and so as you said, I generally sees like I think Kyra's like a grumpy aunt to Ajisai. Um, I can see that. Yeah. Like, they try not to make it their problem or anything, but they, they the most, when they, like, suggest plans, uh, 
they know that the major objections are going to be the multitude of what ifs that will come from Kyra, mm -hmm. and Agisai doesn't really deal in what ifs, so it's it, they, they they think Kyra wastes a lot of time and is very angry at people for often very little reason, um, and also Kyra. <laughs> it's kind of the opposite of Cross. Kyra beats around the bush with everyone that they care about. Nadi is like, "Why? What the fuck? Just talk. We have this other woman following us, and you guys are like weird. Like, what's what is this? Just, just say words to each other. Be, be upfront. Yeah. Just tell her Ad you want to kiss. Adjusai like really appreciates directness mm -hmm. and appreciates um. I guess optimism, I, I, they're, they're, they're really not about, like, grim pragmatism. Yeah. And Kyra is often very dour, questions everybody's intent, questions the, like, possibility of things failing. Ajisa has died once and it worked out. Like, they're, they're okay with sometimes the worst case happening. And that comes from a place of thoughtlessness. But mm -hmm. it's also, you know, just part of they're how they're motivated intellectually and who so wait so that maxine. was maxine a lot like krusk is very fun to mess with because maxine gets riled up about like nothing and agisai loves riling them up agisai is very much a poker with a stick person like if you're oh, around yeah. them i i would hate them in real life if i had to be around <laughs> agisai i would just be like can you like integrate into society please can like you please like if somebody doesn't want to talk about something and agisai picks up on that her mission becomes poke that until you talk about it because I guess she likes it when people are being more emotionally honest. Like, mm -hmm. that's not her thought process, but when I, whenever I'm portraying her, I always find that she's happiest when people are indulging in their, like, larger emotions and when they're mm -hmm. being more expressive because she thinks that it's more genuine. So she likes picking on people. And she also, when people get complicated and that complication leads to them not talking or suppressing what they feel... She finds that boring and trite, and it's like, I fucking don't want to leave. That's why she doesn't like Waterdeep in general, because everyone gets kind of in their head in Waterdeep, and she's like, I want to go back to the wilderness where everything is raw and real. Um, but yeah, Maxine, I would say probably, like, if there's like a... I guess it's also sibling energy in a, in a, in a weird way. It's kind of like Maxine's the more together elder sibling and Ajisai just likes finding the holes in the armor and being like, hey, yell. I want you to yell. I don't know what about, but I want to hear you yelling. Um, Be mad about something, do it. I think Ajisai also, because their relationship kind of comes naturally to them, mm -hmm. they, they find the weird, uh, not that I'm calling them weird, but they, they find the weird tiptoey nature of both Kyra and Maxine's relationships to be really kind of obnoxious and strange. So whenever anything to do with Malcolm or to do with Yuri comes up, they just inherently are like, just say what you mean. Why are you upset? It's like the is... only reason it took us so long to say what we meant is because she was dead. Yeah, she was like literally emotionally suppressed in a wraith. Yeah, like fucking or Regan, revenant, sorry. <laughs> revenant, but at the same time, Regan's like, nah, I'd still hit that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, nah, I like that one. Oh jeez. Yeah, and then I think I think if anyone yeah. in the group, barring Regan, um, if anyone in the group is just like, just re fucking ready to go, ready to get along without a moment's notice, it's absolutely Casper. They're just like oh, yeah. a tiny, a tiny whirlwind of bad influence. <laughs> See, like. Regan doesn't dislike Casper. He just really <laughs> fucking frustrates her. Good because start. <laughs> I was like, might as well just start where you did. But like, he does. Like, <laughs> she she likes him, but in the way that you like your little brother, but also want to throw them through a fucking brick wall. Yep. Yep. He is such an annoyance to her. It's like he's a good guy. He doesn't do much of the thinking thing, and there's only so much of that that she can take. 
It's true. It's great. Like, listen, she loves, like, she loves Ajisai and loves that energy about her. But also she can talk to Ajisai and be like, hey, let's have a conversation about this and maybe we don't do that. And she'll be like, all right, cool. Cool, buddy. Great. And that's fine. Casper doesn't fucking listen and that drives her up the wall. <laughs> and it's like, no, you're great and you're good at what you do. Can you take a fucking breath, please? <laughs> can you take your meds, though? <laughs> um, it's that. Um, like... <laughs> He's great. He needs to take a chill pill sometimes. And she is coming from like a family dynamic where she has twin little brothers. And they are a lot. <laughs> and even then, Casper is like an enigma to her. She's like, I just, I can't with you. I can't. And maybe it's because we're not related and that's why, but I don't know. I don't know how to deal with you. Ah. Uh. <laughs> It's the joy of having a, a party <laughs> member whose driving force is, I'm here to adventure, is that mm -hmm. they, it's like, it, I love that dynamic anytime anyone plays it, but there is an inherent disconnect to sensibility that comes with that. Yeah. I love it. I love it so much. Heckin, or it's like kind of adverse to like, uh, Adusai in some ways. Regan finds Kyra really easy to be around a lot of the time. Like she does share some sentiments where it's like, all right, get to the point though, and maybe we need to focus our energies a little bit. Yeah. Um, Regan can be pretty easily swept up in things where it's like, okay, this means a lot to you because she's such an emotional person. Where it's like, oh, this means a lot to you. Okay, let's find a way to tackle that within what we're doing. But she's rare and like, so I think she's less bothered by Kyra's diversions. Um, but she finds Kyra interesting to talk to she is a little scared of her in some ways because kyra makes her nervous um in ways where it's just like hey you immediately had a problem with my magic and that made me really anxious and feel very awkward because no one's really had a problem with me before <laughs> And I don't know, not no, I'm so amazing, everybody loves me, I'm Regan. But like, she's not used to people having an aversion to her magic because it was always just very accepted where she comes from. So when people are like, hey, that's a bad thing. Raising dead is a bad thing. She's like, but death is part of life, I don't understand. And you know, my girlfriend was dead. <gasps> What? Oh, God bless! You were talking about me. You made me yeah. sneeze. <laughs> ah, I see. Talking about Adjusai. Yep. So the part the of the in your brain. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, but she likes Kyra a lot. Um, she's very determined to like continue building like a strong friendship there. She likes talking about magic, and she feels like in a lot of ways very seen by Kyra. Like after they got over the hump of she has a problem with how I do my geek. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a weird mode today. I finally slept. So but much. enough about Ajusai. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How you do your geek isn't relevant. <laughs> I knew you were going to take it that way, and I was waiting for it. <laughs> 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 but um, because, like, Kyra was like, hey, you mentioned, like, this one time you want to learn potions. I have somebody who I can introduce you to. And that meant the world being introduced to Fala. Like when Kyra made that connection for Regan, she was just overjoyed and felt so fucking seen. Um, because as we've seen with like Regan's dad, he's like, oh, you're actually pursuing that. And it's like, yeah, don't hate me y'all, please. <laughs> I just want to please my parents, but also, ah. Um, let's see, with Max, she fucking loves Maxine so much like she thinks she's just an absolute joy to be around she finds her strange and kind of weird which intrigues her for sure mm -hmm. um she will she enjoys meddling with maxine a little bit please see sending the animal messenger to malcolm <laughs> because much like ajisai she's like y'all get to the fucking point malcolm right? is malcolm is upsetting uh, Maxine by not speaking to her and that's clearly bugging her. Well, time for me to pull up my mom pants here and uh, meddle. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
like, all right, cool. Talk to your fucking girlfriend. Um, but she, she likes Maxine a lot and she likes seeing her like softer side. She's at this point, she's like, I know who you are, Maxine. I love that. She adores her, uh, with Krusk, loves him. He is a frustration though. It's true. It's like, she just, (laughs) to be the mom of the group, she just wants what's best for him. Like, he just <laughs> wants him to be okay and to look after himself. And that's where the main frustration comes from. It's like, please look after you. You're not doing that. You are being so, you're clearly scared of what's going on. And yet you're so you about things that you're like, what if I mess with these elemental magics that I've discovered that I have that connect me to things that scare me? What if I fuck with these things? And that is a great frustration for her because, like, on one hand, you're freaking out. On the other hand, you're like, ooh, let me poke the bear. Ooh! <laughs> lots, of, lots of annoyance. But also, yeah. she, she loves him and she is like, yeah, no, I, I care a lot about you. But also, I have decked you in the face because you deserved it. <laughs> Krusk is a interesting energy. Yeah, I love him. <laughs> Pre pre Casper, he was also like the key thing that enabled Agi to be like, I have mm-hmm. a stupid plan. Everyone just follow my lead. And Krusk was pretty 50 50 on whether or not he'd be, either be yeah. like, I don't know, that's kind of a bad idea, or being like, all right, let's go, let's do it. Fucking, whatever we're doing, all right. Like, it was, it was always kind of, it, it, it wasn't always yeah. there. But if he could get on a path, he enabled Agi Sai's gremlinness. I loved it. I love it so much. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'm going to ask briefly. I say briefly. It's us. Uh-oh. <laughs> I knew what this would be. Uh, so to answer like the other parts of the question, do either of us have theories on the cults at all? Or are we right. just kind of like, hmm. Like, do we have theories on the cults? I want to know where you're standing on it and what your thoughts are. Uh, us or our characters? Uh, our characters. Okay. So, Ajisai... Um, can hold two thoughts at a time, <laughs> and one of them's always Regan. I was gonna say one of them is so, girlfriend. So, uh, the other is why doesn't Great Weapon Master work? <laughs> uh, but uh, the the I would say their understanding of the cults is pretty like it unfolds as it happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, their their thoughts go as far as the obvious mechanics, and that she's trying to figure out the the structure of them, and she's like, okay, so each one of them. They each have, like, a head honcho. They each have an artifact. And from what she's seen, like, basically, she doesn't fully understand these ele- this elemental prince stuff as much as she understands. They each seem to have a monster that they're trying to manifest in the material plane. Um, and she'd prefer that not happen, uh, having seen one of them now. But... She doesn't f- want to like fully understand what they did. There was a period where she assumed that they were just trying to create more devastation orbs to like be able to cause natural disasters. Um, but she's so driven by revenge, or was so driven by revenge, that what they were doing was almost irrelevant. She only cared about figuring out the mechanics of what they're doing in front of her so she could mm-hmm. dismantle it. Um, and at this point... She's a bit concerned by the fact that the spear has changed somewhat. Yeah. But she also has no idea what to really make of that beyond being like, okay, so there's four of them. We broke one, and now this has changed. Does that mean the others changed? We need information. Like, that's that's kind of as far as she's gone in that respect. She also, um, because they're the easiest face to assign anything to... As a player, I think I'm fully aware that the prophets are kind of just stand-ins. Like, they're, they're a go-between. They're, the elemental yeah. princes are using them to do things. But from Ajisai's perspective, the prophets are the cults. So she is of the opinion that if she were to kill all of the prophets, things would fall into disarray entirely and the whole thing would resolve. So she, anytime anyone tries to talk past them, she's kind of like, I don't know. I mean, we didn't have to fight the big earth thing. So, what if we go kill the Minotaur? We've already got two of them. There's two left. We'll figure it out. We'll get there. Yeah. How about you? Do you have any 
Thoughts and theories. With Regan, a big concern of hers and a big theory is that, well, obviously, by, you know, <laughs> just the proof is in the pudding, the pudding being Krusk. Krusk is kind of, in her mind, is kind of at the center of things in some way, especially with, like, what he's expressed seeing and what he hasn't expressed and with all of, like, the powers showing up and, like, the way, like, he get, him getting chained to these different things and um, he's a lot more at the center of things than I think he's willing to think about and that's her main concern. Uh, the big boy who she was worried about coming through, like the one that we just dealt with, um, the name of it is escaping me right now. It's in my notebook that's next to me, but I don't feel like looking through it right now. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at my Regan book. I was like, nah, it's fine. Um, that was her main one because of the nightmare that she had, where she's like, okay, I can kind of focus on the other ones a little bit more now, but I think, uh, Unlike Ajisai, she's thinking there is definitely more going on than just, like, the prophets. Because, especially that now that we've seen, even though we roasty-toastied him, um, we've seen that essentially the prophets or the people at the head of the cults will change out. Yeah. Usually for less powerful people. But um, it's like, they're not what we're what we need to deal with here what we need to do is figure out all of get all the information together and figure out what the actual goal of the cults is here that's where she's at if she's in gather information mode right now but with how we usually go she's like i'm not gonna get my fucking answers i'm just gonna i'm along for the ride at this point <laughs> yeah. Mostly it's protect Krusk, even though he keeps not letting me, but I'm going to be a stick in the mud. And if letting him call me mom is what that takes, fine. Fucking fine. Adventure. <laughs> so funny to me. Uh, I guess the last part of that question that we've riffed on for half an hour, which is fine for me, but it's like, What's, what's Ajisai's plan for meeting Regan's parents? She's gonna be like, I'm relying on pickles. Pickles worked last time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's basically pickles. It's it's we, Ajisai doesn't actually have any major fear of meeting anybody. Like, it, it'd be really funny if she did, but Ajisai's got such a I can handle anything vibe towards anything mm -hmm. that they're more or less just excited to meet the rest of Regan's family, unless other people put into her mind that like that might go weird or that might be stressful in which case she's like why what don't i know um but like that plan oh geez um <laughs> it's okay to say you don't pickles know it's pickles. pickles like it's pickles in the context of it's something equivalent to like find anything to open a conversation and latch onto that thing <laughs> Because really, oh, like the the pickles thing and like the the dowry was just a general understanding of like this is a way to this is a, this will this will get nice my breaker. point across. Yeah, um, they don't really care about social norms or oh, yeah. traditions because they come from a place where they're like, well, I don't know much of anyone else's shit, and nobody seems to even know that my little temple existed. So it's it's kind of a moot point to try mm -hmm. to understand the traditions of other people and try to get them right. So she's way more about, like, stupid gestures, uh, thus the pickles. Um, but yeah, probably find something silly to latch on to and hope it works. I think that's one of, like, Regan's favorite things about Ajisai, is just how, like, loose she is with things like that. It's like, she'll, she just kind of figures it out along the way. And, like, that's just something that, like, so, like, just she loves because Regan is aware that she can be a bit of a stick in the mud sometimes, <laughs> especially being the eldest sibling is a big part of where that comes from. So I think having someone like Ajisai really balances that part of her. Yeah. Whereas Ajisai is fully aware that she's a chaos gremlin with no sense of direction who has no idea how the world works. So Regan being able to occasionally be like, hey, so thing is very helpful. That's yeah. very much why she puts, like, 
indelible trust into anything Regan says and will do anything Regan tells her to do because she knows that she's probably not <laughs> aware of the consequences of her actions. But Regan's the only person that'll do that. Krusk, you know, is pragmatic in a sense, but... To a point. Agisai doesn't really care. They only <laughs> care about Regan's worldview and being consistent with it. <laughs> Yeah. Again. All right, I'm gonna ask you another question. Welcome All right, here we D4. go. Okay, 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 it's for you. I'm going to roll a d12. That's good. I would have had trouble answering it if it wasn't for me. Okay, okay, okay. Oh. Uh, Logan, you yes. You have talked a lot about how the frame built are more wood than metal, but you keep covering them with cool armor. Why did you decide to design them the way that you did instead of making them more mechanical? Like, why go oh. more wood natural route? People are co made of skin and bone, but we <laughs> cover them in cool armor. <laughs> <laughs> it's just what they are. Fucking, they're like a stone frame with wooden, wood like fibers covering their bodies. And fucking, well, not covering their bodies, constituting their bodies and whatnot. And then because they come from a highly technical society and because they got to protect their fleshy bits, they, they put armor on top of it. And because their bodies are slightly able to, to integrate and to move around and, like, adapt and bring in metal, they're like, well, I'm going to put anything in my body to make it better. I'm going to put in metal. It's just, like... I don't know. It's like, well, the Daleks are fucking war machines in Doctor Who, but they're squishy inside. It's just what they are. <laughs> fucking. It is one of the greatest points of contention. <laughs> this fucking robot thing that because I care about it, people won't let go of. I'm fully aware. But it's just you know, the latest one is the fucking robots can be made of wood. It's like, yeah, they can, genius. Because but I fucking, said so. Oh, you're fucking sidestepping the goddamn point, though, I think. The point is they're not robots. Ah! It doesn't even matter, but it does, though, actually, because then when you have actual robots, like the DGRs, it's like, well, it's different. That's a robot. Fucking Iron Golem, not a robot. Frame built, not a robot. Warforged, for the purposes of conversation, not a robot. Fucking DGRs, robot. You know what the definition of a robot is? No, tell me. A machine built to emulate the characteristics or functions of a human, or a humanoid in this case. Well, they are know. a humanoid. Well, they they are know. not. They don't emulate humanoids. They are humanoids. <laughs> they're not. Anyways, the, the reason <sighs> the reason they're covered in cool shit is because their background historically is as they they come from a slice of like Magitech history that briefly far exceeded everything around it so all of their shit just looks like that plus it's i'm gonna be real a lot of like the like robotic air quotes stuff is actually just like the look of Copetter and Copetter's mm -hmm. aesthetic even though he's not around like all the idolans kind of have a vibe and they're direct yeah. people it's kind of like how you know the the nephilim uh are like very grecian inspired and very like, fucking, what was it? I can't remember the exact dichotomy. It's like the Kaijo are Roman and the uh, Nephilim are Grecian. Very similar but different. Yeah. Um, but the, the frame belt, they're covered in, like, techie-looking armor and stuff just because, like, that makes the most sense for protecting themselves. And they come from a society that put a lot of value in, in, into invention and creation and that influence the kind of tech and items that they used and it just is where it is and i understand there's a a level of foot in mouth in terms of culture where it's like well why'd you make them look like robots and i was like i don't know is it illegal to make them look like robots they I made them look cool shut up <laughs> it's just where they ended up i fucking don't know what to tell you yeah yeah, it just is. It, I mean, the same issue applies to Warforged, except Warforged, like, even Warforged have, like, fibrous muscles and stuff mm -hmm. with, like, metal on top. But, you know, I'd like to abandon the Warforged conversation entirely since Somnus Domin is moving away from that even being a thing. Heck in. Yeah. I don't know. It just, it's just their aesthetic. It's their thing that makes them different. I like it. I think it's, yeah. I think it's fucking neat. Yeah, I like but the frame yeah. build. I, I'm loving this whole 
fucking section and like learning about like their histories and shit like that. I'm like, it's just neat. It's fucking cool. I love it. Yeah. And other cool things, I'm gonna ask a question. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe oh. I'll ask a question. Yeah. I mean, if it's a question for me, I'll throw it in call chat and you can ask me. Oh. Oh, it is for me. <gasps> All right. Where's this going? All right. Let me. <laughs> Rolling the D12. Yeah. A number five. Oh, that's my favorite. And I'll, I will throw it in the call chat. I mean, I could throw it in Wits and Crits chat as well. I'll just toss it in there. It's in the Wits and Crits chat. All right. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm fucking uh, welcome to the other side of Wits and Crits. <laughs> it's me. I'm your temporary host, Logan Laidlaw. I don't have nearly the same list of credentials that's coming up, but here, here I am. I'm sitting in here. I know I'm my Logan picture man. looks. I know my picture might lead you to believe that I'm a younger, nerdier Adam Conover, but I'm not. I'm <laughs> Logan, and I'm here to set to ask my my guest today is Hayden Davio. Welcome to the show, Hayden. Davio Saab. Hello, thank you so much for having me. It's such a joy to be here. Oh, I've wanted you on the show since it began, Aiden Aww. Davio. Oh, it's been my dream to get you on here. Now here you are. I'm here. I'm Hayden, man. What you got for me, boy? Oh, I've got a. I've got a. One sec. I got to roll a dice to determine my question. Oh, a six. Okay, now I gotta do a second roll, because there's two. Another six! Okay. <laughs> so, uh, all right, the question, the viewers are burning a hole in their mind. Mm, I see. Uh, uh, is, uh, uh, Aviana. <gasps> uh, being as closed off as you are most of the time, and your apparent opinion of yourself as a Hanyo, did you ever expect love to be in the cards for you? Oh, it's a spicy love question, Fuck Hayden no. Davio. No, she did not. <laughs> Uh, neither time it has occurred. Um, she never, like, n no matter how she might feel about people, she never expected anyone to, uh, be open to that with her and to ever view her as more than, uh, the monster she views herself as. She, mm. most of the time, finds herself kind of repulsive. Um... And she is very scared of herself, not just because of what she looks like, but because of her heritage. Um, that she never thought anyone would have feelings for her in any capacity. Uh, so it's, even though she's like been in now two relationships, she's still uh, perplexed. Um, <laughs> I think she, I'm, I believe she's mentioned before. She's like, I don't expect that boy to be fucking waiting. Nah, <gasps> nah. He's had his fun. I've been out of the picture long enough. Again, at this point, it's it's you know it is what it is. <laughs> um, she and it's not for like lack of. It's a, not so much like lack of trust or belief in the people that she's with. It's that she doesn't believe that she is worthy of that. Uh, worth, she doesn't really believe she's worthy of being loved. Uh, so, especially with having someone, especially like Rory, who's been so unconditional a lot, who's been like, yeah, you do what you do, and that greatly frustrates me a lot of the time, because please <laughs> fucking stop. Um, he's always been there, and she's so confused by that. It's like, mm. I, but appreciates it. So all that to say, no, she did not ever expect love to be in the cards for her, and she expected to just be alone for all of her life, and she had kind of come to a place of acceptance about that, and now she has all of these people, like the highest standard, who are just like, no, no, we're keeping you, you grumpy bitch, we love you, you're staying, deal with us. Uh, so she's feeling very confused. Which is, mm. it's fun to play with. You know, I think, uh, I think it's a, I thought, you know, I think it's a, an actual lack of mm. mirrors. <laughs> she couldn't afford them. Apparently, because she doesn't have any idea how <laughs> fucking hot she is. She doesn't. <laughs> Which is, like, not the question. <laughs> but know. it's just such a, it's just such a, like, fucking, no, she never expected to be loved. It's like, well, there are various kinds of love and, uh, <laughs> Aviana's kind of an Olympic 10, so... <laughs> Little it's like, bit. It's like, imagine 
like a self-loathing version of you know the robot chicken sketch with uh, Anakin and Padme where she's just like, no, Anakin, I'm a senator. <laughs> and it's just like yes! doing increasingly sexy things <laughs> like in the room is just like that. But all of her dialogue is about self-loathing yep. while she is just increasingly showing how incredibly she's hot she is. so hot. <laughs> Fucking, that was a big, re like, to kind of lean on that a little bit. That's why, like, when Miriam put up, like, the picture in, like, the Magnificent Mansion, she's like, is that what I looked like in that fucking dress? And he's like, yeah. It's like, I don't know how to deal with this feeling. Oh. Oh, that's, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. It wasn't even like, a, oh, Miriam's into me. Because oh, Miriam, Miriam's like, you down the fuck? And she's like, nah, man. No. For a multitude of reasons, but no. Um, but it really took her aback, like, seeing that, because the reason that she is, like, held on to, like, that dress and, like, how she felt in it, it was the first time that she ever felt, like, beautiful. And she's like, I feel good. And then <laughs> fucking Rory's reaction was like, oh, Maybe I do look okay and I'm not horrifying all the time, but that quickly was stuffed down by the self-loathing of, no, shut up, you're awful. <laughs> but yeah. Now, Avi is, uh... Avi is, uh, got the past that, uh, most books assume a tiefling should have in terms of self-image, whereas Miriam's mm -hmm. over here being like, I have a mixture of the past, but also the way everybody plays a tiefling. Yep. <laughs> Fucking, but uh, no, I've, you know, Avi's, mm, excuse me, Avi's like perception of themselves is interesting to see move along. And I'm, I'm happy that Avi and Rory, who were originally gonna be just sort of walk in, walk off characters, yep. got to stick around more. Uh, oh, Rory. I wonder if Avi oh, hadn't stuck around if the group would have, like, continued to bother him. How do you mean? Like, Well, I mean, because he still would have had some use in that even if Avi didn't stick around as a player, oh, uh, as, a, yeah. as a character. It's not like they couldn't go to the, the, you know, bother the people at the gates to the Platinum District and be like, hey, yeah. could you fetch that guard boy we know? Like, yeah. it's possible Rory could have kept coming around. Um he, I probably would have had him show up more because he has a position that's relevant. Mm -hmm. But, you know, because Aviana stuck around, his involvement was more pointed. Yeah. Um, in a certain direction. So, yeah, it's... Uh, no, that's... It's interesting to think about what some NPCs would be if their, like, related PCs weren't necessarily around. I've thought about that, like, quite a bit recently, just, like, thinking about, like, guest games and stuff like that. It's like, huh, we've actually met quite a few people that might be of use to us in the future. Yep. So it's it, it's fun to think about. I like it. If Vestige has one thing, it's NPCs. What? No. It's a lot of them. We don't have any other ones. With a lot of names. If Vestige yeah. has one thing, it's proper nouns. Mm -hmm. Fucking. So which fucking I, re many. I recognize to be a problem, but I also can't help it. Nah. Live your truth, buddy. I love it. Because I, I find it such a joy, like, meeting all the new characters and just. I don't, it. The big reason that I like there being so many NPCs, it makes the world feel so full and lived in. And I'm gonna gush at you here for a second and then ask another question, but I'm gonna gush at you real quick. Oh. Is that the way that you craft NPCs and you've crafted where, like, their places in the world, they feel like real people, which I think really lends itself to the intrigue and mm. with feeling like this is a real place and a real world and these people that we're meeting they have entire lives outside of this conversation that we're having with them. And like with I Fosh. love that. Like, Fosh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy my text? <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Well, was that what that was about? That's what that was about! Oh, I thought... So you, have you figured... Oh, you yeah, think no. you figured that out? I, I figured it out pretty quickly. Okay. <laughs> I put those pieces together very quickly. I was like, oh, okay, I got it. Cool. As I as I very um, 
as a very lovingly for me <laughs> said in a group chat that we were all VCing in the other day. I have, for people who are listening, I've given Spencer all of what he needs to figure out exactly what's going on with Fosh. Uh, however, the information presented to him was presented in the form of something one would need to read. And Spencer has one critical flaw that will prevent that from aiding him. That he is Spencer. And he won't. <laughs> so, I'm gonna, I'm very, I'm very, uh, a bit smug about the fact that I'm like, I don't know, man. I, you, I literally wrote the answer for you and gave it to the group and you just Dude, haven't bothered to read it. It's so blatant, too. It, right? It's literally everything. You it's told very... him everything he needed to know in game and then also handed him written word of yep. here you go, buddy. So, while... A part of me, my, my little helpful Hayden instinct is to be like, hey, buddy, maybe go read that. I'm not going to say shit. Oh, no, I, I want I, to be able to no. eventually hold it over him and be I, like, I don't know, man. <laughs> fucking everyone else figured it out. Well, Hayden. Fucking. <laughs> Hi, the note taker. <laughs> but yeah, no, hmm, crazy, interesting. Weird how that works. There's only one aspect of it. Okay, it's, it's weird. And this is a weird tangent. No, but go. That's what we're here to do. There is a thing. That if you've been paying attention to the cauldron and how gods and such interact with it, there is a thing that would probably turn you away from the the truth of Fosh. The truth of Fosh. <laughs> that's that's those that'll be the name of my, my autobiography. Um, <laughs> but uh, the truth of Fosh. However, for me to assume Spencer is confused about Fosh based on the way the cauldron and gods interact implies that I expect he remembers how the cauldron and gods interact, which I do not. Uh, so I'm like, no, he doesn't even get the pass there. Because, um, uh, spoiler, I guess, for people at home a little bit, because uh, you figured it out, Hayden. Yeah. Uh, Fosh is related. There, there are elements of Fosh that are explainable mm -hmm. uh, through knowledge of a certain lesser deity in Somnus Domina. The thing I'm talking about being that gods can't get into the cauldron. Like, lesser gods just cannot. They are not allowed in there. Which is the only thing that, if you've been paying attention, should confuse the matter. And there's, yeah. a, there's a reason for it um, that may or may not ever come up in this particular case. That's why I say to you, no, Tenke, he was like, I'm not going to be able to come find you guys if you're in the cauldron. I'll have to mm -hmm. meet you later. Like, I'm, I'm not yeah. allowed in there. Um, but... but uh, so you know, there's the, you you could be like, well, Logan, that doesn't. You, this is my sense. Well, Logan, that doesn't make sense. You can't be. You can't. They, fucking. Why would it be this? But that implies that a he's read the material and b that he remembers that. Which I'm like neither. <laughs> Spencer only knows what's happened in game and only what's happened in game in the last twenty minutes. We love That's you, Spencer. Not, <laughs> it's funny. It's true. I do. No, I love him. And he, we he love and him he, so much. And he tries, but he and Carrie are so like fucking. I don't know what's going on. They say as they willfully eject information from their brains. <laughs> no, they uh. Fucking, your players come in all sorts. Every table's got a note taker. Every table's got the, the fucking point man. Every table's got the people who want to do the schmoozing. Everyone's got the, the, the merchant player. Like, they're just the ones that are there for the, the gameplay, and they're much more grounded in the moment. It's not their fault that some, like, Vestige is a highly cultural, like, fucking one-piece length dot hack deep fucking yep. lore driven story it's not their fault but it is what it is <laughs> i'm like because there's so many like details and like deep things so many threads to pull on i'm like oh yes give me that shit yeah give me the like <laughs> the fucking grimoire near fucking extra books to read so that i can understand the source <laughs> material Oh jeez, man! There's a part of me that would love to say near deep instead of dot hack deep, but I like I I'm already being a little bit like self elating by saying dot hack deep. So I'm like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna. I'm gonna but, but that's just like immediately what my brain went to. Also, I have near music on right now, so that's just where my brain went. Nice, <laughs> Hayden. I would yeah. like to offer you an opportunity. I don't do this often. Uh, I'd like to offer you an opportunity to ask a question on my show. Oh my god, really? That's Holy shit. Yeah. 
Okay. Well. In fact, you, let's play a game. I want to hear you. Why don't want to? Why don't? Okay. Let's restart the whole thing. Not like the video, but like back to the start. All right. Let's do this. Like you're the host. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. Okay. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, Wits and Crits, Logan's amazing show that he put together all on his own. He's just amazing. Oh, thank right? you. He's just fabulous. Uh, you know, it like replaced Chat 19 or whatever, and it, it streams more frequently, I guess. Uh, I got all the art done. It was all me. Yeah, it was, it was all Logan. I drew uh, it. Hi, I'm, I'm Hayden Davio, or as everyone pronounces it, Davio, because, no, it's, it's pasta. It's, Davio eh, it's pasta. It's Davio. Uh, I'm Dob. Davio Sab. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I guess I'm running Wits and Crits now, so that's a thing. Uh, let's do, I'm here with my lovely friend Logan Laidlaw. We're oh, hey, good questions. to be on the show. I was wanting to be on the show. It's me. Here. You might, uh, you might, you might look at me. You might think of a young Adam Conover, but I'm not. Oh my! I got a capybara. I understand. You have some questions for me. Uh, I got some questions for you. I'm gonna roll a D4. Ooh, okay. It's Yo, for... if you get a one, I should be the. <laughs> <laughs> it's a three, so it's for both of us. Okay, 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 okay. Which is this? Which is this? Okay. Hmm. Ship question, bitch. Let's go. Oh fuck. Oh, this is similar to one that was asked on Cody and Carrie's. I see, I see, I see the point here. Uh, for both, how do Aviana and Rory like to spend time together now that they are a couple? Anything specific either of them enjoy most? Anything either of them want to do? There hasn't been a lot of opportunity to do much of anything currently. No, why is my iPad ringing? Anyway, go ahead. I thought I turned <laughs> everything off, but go ahead. Because, like... Since since their relationship began, they've been uh, there was like a, the a, a little bit of a lull where they all relaxed for like what a week. Yeah. Um, and then it was almost immediately like off off to the races. Um, Bye, babe. Yeah. Oh, hello. Oh, bye, babe. Bye, I thought you said hi. Oh, nah. I was like, is it, is, 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 is ooh. What's no. it? I'm from all. I'm off my groove. You threw off my groove. I sure fucking did. But anyway, continue. There hasn't been a whole I'm lot sorry. of time to you do. You threw off not Adam Conover's groove. <laughs> um, the title instead of with Logan Laidlaw, it's with not Adam Conover. Yeah. <laughs> oh fuck! Oh, I'm forgetting uh, blank on the name of the uh, show. Fucking. Um, I don't remember. Fucking not not Adam Conover ruins everything. Logan ruins everything. Um. Fucking, but yeah, no, the relationship. So it's, I expect it's like not terribly extravagant. I don't imagine nah. them like I imagine them just going for walks, spending time with each other. I imagine like having dinner is a pretty big thing because Rory is a chronic uh, guardaholic and he's doing his job all the time. So his downtime probably just looks like a lot of very low stress activities. And yet he's know, dating Avi. You... <laughs> low and stress that's... activities. I don't know, man. Different <laughs> people are stressed out by different things. True. How about you? What do you think? Um, oh my god. Is that, is that mine? That's oh, you. No. <laughs> no. Why do I have an alarm for 4 p.m. that says get up and do anxiety stuff? My mental health Hello. is fine. <laughs> You're like, I'm good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> but speaking of, uh, why did my music stop? What the fuck? background music oh it's because i didn't put it on loop that's on me um anyway uh it, it's much like that it's things that they've kind of like done before on the show it's like very chill things uh a big thing that like avi likes about being with rory is that he's much the opposite of her adventuring life and while she at especially at this point cares very much for the highest standard she's run with io kane they're a lot all the time. And while they hold a very special place in her heart, Rory is much the opposite of that. And he is, she finds him very easy to be around and very chill, in, especially in comparison. Is he a stick in the mud? Yeah, but she's like a little into that. But um, she is very much like, yeah, let's, let's go for a hike. Let's get, especially you, Mr. Roar Boy, let's get you out of the city. Let's go see some fucking nature. Let's spend some time at home and just let's do dinner let's relax because we both could fucking use it 
because uh, I think a big thing for her was uh, when he's like, hey, if you need a place, I got a place. You want to come to my place, girl? Because that's how that went. Um, <laughs> but he, I, something that's totally stuck in my brain was like, things can be calm if you want, like if you want them to be. And I understand if that's not what you want right now, but you know, maybe someday that stuck with her. And that was I, the moment where she's like, yep. All right. That's the boy. This is the path we're on. Um, but no, she finds him very calm. And you mentioned dinner and it just got me curious. Cause I'm like, I don't think this would ever come up in game. And it just made me curious. Does the boy know how to cook? And would he ever cook for his lady if he does know how to cook? I feel like probably. Like, Rory's not, like, totally inept in yeah. personal <laughs> matters. He was, he's, he's, he's been raised by, like, the summer grass equivalent of a noble family. Mm -hmm. um, like, they don't, they don't have knights. It's a very, um, I mean, we've made that very clear with uh, the whole thing with Quintus. They, they don't believe in, like, that type of nobility, but he comes from a, a relatively noble family. Um, he had a would have had a very sophisticated upbringing. He would have been trained to act with decorum. Uh, he so yeah, I imagine um, he must be able to because I don't I don't imagine we haven't like gotten into his home mm -hmm. life very much, but I don't no. imagine them to be incredibly wealthy or to like have servants or anything. No. But I imagine. He would have been, like, raised to present himself well, especially beside his brother. Yeah. So I imagine that things like cooking and cleaning and grooming and whatnot would be a big part of that, which is probably why he's got such a, a pretty boy persona, why he's got such a... Why he maybe resembles a certain um, a charming prince from another Thank franchise. You. Oh, why he... You. Which is not... Here's the thing. <laughs> like, it's... It's the, mostly Every I Every time enjoy, that comes up, I'm I like, I'm just... I enjoy getting riled up because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> totally. That's, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm largely the same way. If I allow myself to get riled up about anything on stream, you can be sure I actually don't care about it. Yeah. The, the things that I'm very, very keen on always being like, if I actually care about this, I will probably never address it on air. Like, yeah. if I allow myself to engage with it on air, it's probably because I'm trying to be goofy. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, like, the frame-built stuff. Legitimately, they're not robots. <laughs> so, shut up. <laughs> but also, like, I don't really care. It doesn't bother me, bother mm -hmm. me. It's just one of those things that I'm like, I know I dug my grave, now I have to fucking sit in it. The the Prince Charming thing. Like, the fucking, so sure. Funny. Like, Here's the thing, like that that so that hair, blonde that hairstyle. The thing is, Prince Charming in Shrek. <laughs> I really hope people follow <laughs> what we're talking about. Otherwise, this is this is a statement of nowhere. Prince Charming in Shrek Two is designed to be a ubiquitous noble pretty boy. So other noble pretty boys looking like him is not like oh it's fucking oh, what what is this weird? It's just he's the it's like any time in like 2000s anime when mm -hmm. like anime characters had Sasuke hair. It's like they're not copying Sasuke. That's just the hairstyle right now it's just in anime. The look. Yeah, like the yeah. parting the hair, swooping down in two sides. Like when people are like, oh, Haseo looks like Sasuke. It's like not really. Not really. Fuck, he's just got. I get it. He's just got hair that parts and does the two stalks. That's all. He's got duck butt hair. Yeah, he's, he's got <laughs> he's got duck butt hair. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong, boy. Mm. Can't, can't. Exactly. He's got duck butt hair. <laughs> that's the. Um, that's it. But yeah, so you know, it's fucking. But yeah, no, I, I to circle back around to it, I guess. Uh, I imagine he's probably a pretty good cook. Uh, it, it's the thing. I imagine he knows how, but I don't imagine he's extensively practiced because he mm -hmm. doesn't seem, he doesn't seem like the type of person to me to uh, care much about food in general. <laughs> Pretty, I mean, Fenris put it pretty aptly when she was like, I'm a teacher to cook, Avi, and she's like, I don't know how to do this. Yeah. Um, he's like, he seems like a steak and potatoes kind of guy. I'm like, yeah, that yes. feels, that, that's pretty fucking, that tracks to me. Yep. Yep. No, he Tarty, absolutely seems good. like I'm getting, I'm getting, I have my protein, I have my vegetable, 
and I have my 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 fiber, and I'm gonna be healthy today. Yep. Um, here I go. Here I go. Look at me go. I'm Rory, man. <laughs> Rory, man. <laughs> here I go. <laughs> Climbing the walls, looking for criminals. Looking for birds. Looking for birds. Oh. Uh... Well, birds or otherwise, I want to look for questions. Yeah. Get another one for both of us. You having a good time, Herber? Herber Dipper. Yeah, you sitting there? Yeah, you enjoying perching? You know, one of well, these with some no crits. Well, seven on this, then we already, we just answered number five dice. Ooh, number two. Okay, okay, okay. It's for Regan and Audrey, say. Ah! For a GC and Reganonan. That's, it says Adusai and Regan, but you know. It's mostly, wow, why did I put this in the both? This is mostly for Adusai. So I okay. guess this is a for you question now. All right, here we go. Uh, Adusai, you and Regan have been through a, a bit of strain since the incident involving the theft. Did it remind you of how powerless you felt when you were trapped inside that mountain and able to do anything as time passed by? Were you feeling a little bit helpless there, Adusai? Yes. Next question. Oh, uh, fucking. <laughs> hey, that's no, fine. Uh, I'll take a single word answer. Was, that was, uh, yeah. Like, Aji is pretty. A lot rolls off her back, but, um, that was interesting to play because I had to mm -hmm. sort through a lot. I, I mean, you notice the way I talk about characters. Like, when I talk about Rory and what I imagine, um, not to be pretentious. GM boy or anything. Not do but, it. Let's uh, go. I I very much believe in creating a foundation for characters, and then once they're in motion, letting my interpretations of them sort of guide what they actually are in the short term. There, there hits a point where I'm like, cool, I know what they are. Um, but I believe in with the style of GMing and world building I do. I I believe in characters telling me who they are and letting things emerge from them mm -hmm. within the parameters of, like, the foundation I created. Yeah, I'm very uh, much the same, so I understand that. And uh, in the case of Ajisai and everything that happened, it was, like, Ajisai is so gung-ho about, like, I can destroy problems. I can fight the cults. I, I got a big electric sword. I'm not scared of, uh, heckin' my, my weird spirit fucking patron who brought me back to life anymore. She's very, like, if it has physical form, I can kill it and I can solve the problem. Uh, this is, I, that is what I'm here for. And Regan is here to solve the mental problems. So, they believed that their role in protecting Regan was to, uh, well, to protect Regan. They they believed that their role was, I am strong enough to protect them from whatever I have to. The thought of something affecting them mentally uh, never occurred to them. And it, whenever that session was happening and things were going sideways, I had to very quickly uh, figure out where I stood on how I felt and where I ended up landing, uh, or rather where it ended up taking me, I suppose is a more apt way to say it, was that... Ajisai was grappling with the fact that this wasn't a problem that could be solved through any kind of application of violence. Mm -hmm. um, and also that Regan had the capacity to like help her when she was dead, when she was a revenant, got her out of the wall, had been there to emotionally support her. And it occurred to her that she's completely useless in that regard, that she wasn't capable of doing for Regan what Regan did for her despite the fact that Regan is also capable of defending herself, which made her feel highly inadequate and made her feel entirely powerless. And um, though she had some degree of certainty that everything would resolve itself, that also ties into the fact that Ajisai allows Regan to dictate her worldview. Mm -hmm. Like, whatever Regan believes to be true, Ajisai will generally adopt to be true um, because she believes that Regan understands the world better and thinks that Regan's view of the world is beautiful and correct and open-minded and warm and so she wants to adopt that and see things through her eyes and also just believe Regan's smarter than her which she is um and so when her mind had been altered all Agisai could really do was probe for the truth of the matter uh which was you know to see where Regan's head was with the bow 
And then once it was obvious that Regan was not Regan, they, uh... God, it was a lot to work through all, all at once. Yeah. But it, it was a lot of powerlessness. It was a lot of um, losing. The, the prospect of being unable to save the only thing that made like living post-Temple Massacre worthwhile. Um, and it just oh. gave them a, a general a, a moment of realizing that like the way that they handle problems couldn't help Regan, which is the first time Agisa has been afraid of anything since she came out of the wall. Because mm -hmm. normally she's like stupid about being afraid. She just does yeah. not comprehend fear. She's not afraid of dying. She did it once, she'll do it again. But that's like the first thing that actually scared her. So that's uh it was yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a complex complex lattice of emotions to sift through. I fucking loved that session. Especially yeah. it, it was just so good. Like playing off of you with the bow moment. It hurt me, Hayden, but also at the same time, I was having so much fun. Just twisting the knife, man. It's just, it's it's so fun playing off of you, and it feels very easy and natural, natural too, when we have scenes together. But like, Regan and Ajisai have a very specific kind of uh, dynamic. And yeah. getting to play with that and play into what Regan was going through was, oh, it was fun. It was real fun. And just yeah. seeing a whole different side of Ajisai and seeing like that more complex side was, was so good. I enjoy the fact that we were both fucking crying by the end of Game You're Ball. right? <laughs> fucking, oh no. We're like, uh, I, 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 I do my best to try to focus on, uh, where things are as opposed to where they're going. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. session was particularly like, I was I was doing my best to just eject myself from my own brain. Um, but the there, there were like legitimate moments of me being like, I have actually no idea where this feeling is going to take me. And yeah. th this, this might be a, depending on how it resolves, I might need a minute after game to like recenter, mm -hmm. and, and it I, I ultimately was fine because it, it came to a conclusion. But it yeah. was one of the I, not to overstate it, okay. uh, it was a thing for me where I was like, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm worried for where I'm letting my brain go and believe things are real, uh, because the, you know being powerless to help a loved one is not a thing you need to be in a fantasy world to understand. No, um, heck in. It's a very primal. Uh, I guess like emotion or fear for just us yeah. as people so it was good yep. and I think I, because uh, we were letting it play moment to moment it just like really felt like true <laughs> it's it's funny like the, that kind of um, the particular kind of overwhelming it is uh, hadn't hit me in the same like uh oh what am I doing way since really early in Vestige. Oh. I don't think I ever had a, an opportunity to talk about it, but mm -hmm, I, I, it. I can't remember if you watched the early Vestige episodes, but when they went to... Uh, oh, what is... I'm forgetting the name of the town now, even though it's my name. The the town at the base of the mountain where they... Um, the Silver Esper was. Mm -hmm. When they met the guy who had uh, traded to the Esper bartered the life of his unborn child for the health of his living sick child um, when he was explaining that to the party. Uh, I also let myself fall into it a bit more than I wanted to, and I remember at the time feeling it like being way too real and not, and having a moment of being like, ah, I'm, I'm like actually feeling devastated. I feel like I am admitting to having murdered a child. Um, and I'm like, it's it's such a very specific. Mm -hmm. Like, I hope I can keep playing in this while doing it honestly, because like sometimes subject matter just I don't know it hits a particular note and it it locks your brain into it, 
and you're as a GM or as, as a player, you have to be like, I want to do this honestly, but I also want D and D to be fun. Yeah, so, you don't want to sit in it so truth so truthfully that you're like, yeah. this is actively like affecting me a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's also interesting. I think that the consequences of living with an action, like living with <clears throat> Regan being changed or uh, and, Oh, my voice is just suddenly given out. Well, this is what I sound like now. The consequences <laughs> of living with your action. Uh, the consequences water. of uh, living with... So, death in D&D, right? Mm-hmm. It's not actually that huge of a deal. You can have a system in place that, like, counts deaths, and, like, after a certain amount, it's hard to be revived, or it's impossible, or whatever. But especially as you keep playing D&D, death is not a huge consequence. It's something that can be reversed and as time goes on more easily so but situations where something has changed in someone's behavior or you've made a decision that is like a Sophie's choice uh, those I think are more visceral to me because they're not like well I have a spell to fix I traded my child's soul for my other child or there's no spell to be like fix make Regan be willing to be fixed and then fix Regan like yeah. There was a re- there's there's resurrection, which is you were dead, now you're not. There's but knowing being in character and knowing that something is persisting differently, and that you won't get what it was back probably, is way more visceral to me than death. So it doesn't come up as often because mm-hmm. most of the tragedy you deal with in D and D is death. Yeah. Which is why I. Most of my NPCs are less concerned with death and more concerned with cultural stuff. Like the, might be a bit hard to understand the Nephilim and w- exactly what their issue with Vestius is, but it's like they don't know if they have choice. Maybe they do, but they don't know, and that's the point, and it matters to them. The whole the whole thing with the Nephilim is very interesting to me, and uh the more i've like sat on stuff like in character and i'm like i'm not gonna say too much just in case shit comes out in game but it's like the more i've sat yeah. on it i was like i just got a lot of, a lot of feelings about this <laughs> <laughs> just just a lot but yeah. um i think yeah that's the whole thing it's like do we actually have like choice and autonomy or not and yep. they deserve to find out it's like if you have a a god that is concerned with like preserving a particular model of society if you have a god like that that is affecting what experiences can go into the creation of your kind um there is just a nagging thing in the back of your head of like am i being when i was created were like non-compliant parts of me removed Mm -hmm. and that's that's the struggle it's not even a matter of not feeling like they can make choices the nephilim are like i could probably leave i could probably just like leave the cauldron and go somewhere else and live but it's the idea that as a as a species not knowing if they are what they could be and the idea that as they're born uh the bits of them that are like problematic even if rightfully so are being shaved off is just something that wouldn't sit well and it's not all of them there's a bunch of them that are like this is fine i don't care like i'm, I'm perfectly happy like, most okay. of the nephilim in pesadromos like they're fine with the way things are it's but there are some that are that are like we don't hate vestius we dislike the idea that the essence of our species is being filtered Mm -hmm. because you'd spend your whole life wondering would i have maybe been slightly different would i have different ambitions um when more of us are created are they going to be what they could have been or are they going to be what's needed? You know, it's uh, so there. It's a very existential struggle. And it's one of those things that if it was a different campaign, I may have it may have been better if one of the players was a Nephilim. So it would be a bit more ground level. Um, but Brandon had cons. So we <laughs> so we didn't get to go down that road. We love you, Brandon. Brandon! But you're a busy bitch. <laughs> oh, it's thundering outside. Oh, it's thundering. Oh, thundering. What's thundering outside, is it? It's fucking cold out there. It's fucking kinda... doing you a shiver. A little bit of frosty weather outside. A little bit of ground shaking thunder. God's burps going on up there. <laughs> Go easy on the Coca Cola there, <laughs> Sky Father. 
<laughs> Sky Daddy. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to ask another question. Thank Speaking you of not your... knowing where things are going, yeah, I exactly. don't know what that was. Yeah. Wah! And that was cocked. Yeah. Ooh, it's for me! Ooh! Wah! Okay, let's see which one is this. You know would be really funny? What? It's a question for you, right? Mm-hmm. What if we pretended I was the host? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could. I'm choosing to answer a different question, because I'm like, nah. Okay. I've already expanded on that a little bit. Let's see. Uh, Regan. <gasps> you used to actively work on your potion craft. Are you still interested in learning to make potions? If so, what kind of potion do you want to make the most? Uh, haste potion, for one. Woo! Um, and she is still really interested in learning her potion craft. There just hasn't been enough downtime uh, in recent like games and things like that with everything that was going on. Um, that she hasn't had time to just sit down and like study it or like practice making potions or anything. She just hasn't had the time. And while we were in Waterdeep, that would have been a great time for her to be like, hey, what's up, Fala? Or, hey, I'm going to go sit up in my room and I'm going to study. Ah. There was no pause in the recording. I don't know what you're talking about, chat. Anyway, uh, Regan, yeah, if she hadn't been in the mental state she was in uh, during their last visit to Waterdeep, she probably would have sat down and focused a little bit more on her potion craft but it's right now that's not her main focus that is like an ultimate goal is she wants to figure out how like she can maybe integrate like her spores into like corrosive ointments or anything like that how she can use it in medicine or if it ends up being hey this is usually like just for like corrosive stuff or poisons and things like that well then that's what I'll do with it, but I want to under I want to use these in a physical sense and also make potions cuz it's it's fun and she's kind of a nerd. <laughs> like Regan is honestly such a fucking nerd. <laughs> That's part of the reason like to go back about like way back to the beginning of this uh the episode like what she likes about Kyra, she understands the nerdness of like learning things, she, Regan loves to learn. And being able to, that was a big reason she wanted to leave her village, is she wanted to learn about the world. It's so fascinating to her and understanding different cultures and people. The stuffiness of like the water deep folk is, she's like, ah, I don't know, man. I don't think I can do this. It's a little too much for me, but uh, yeah. She, she enjoys learning about people and just learning about like different magics and things of the world so you know maybe someday she'll get back to it if we have any downtime she'll probably do it but there just hasn't been time or appropriate you know mental spaces lately yeah, yeah. I totally get what you what you mean if I could just anytime we're in water deep I feel like such a, a stick in the mud because I'm always every time we're like let's go back to water deep my brain's like oh cool Angie is gonna be bored for four sessions yep good neat it's okay we'll go kiss or something <laughs> right like hola, la, 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 potions hola, la, 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 did it also muffins apparently apparently <laughs> I had a blueberry muffin this the other day when I went to the coffee shop after a session and I was just like <laughs> this is only funny to me. Just I was eating. I decided I was like, I'm gonna eat the bottom first because no one else will understand this. But this is a for me <laughs> thing now. Putting muffin paper in your mouth is <laughs> Regan just looking at her like, yeah, that's my girlfriend. She's so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's the one. She's the You're one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that just has a mess. I love her so much. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you another question. Yeah. Bill. Oh, okay, let's see. Do we have any more for both of us? Because <gasps> the last both of us really wasn't. Wasn't really a both of us. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, 
this one's fun. I just decided this is the one I want to ask because this is the one that jumped out to me. <gasps> but that's against the rules. Fine, I'll roll a dice. Mm. Oh, look, it's a four because I said so. Everything in order. <laughs> uh, sometimes in acting, you take on... I, this is a question that I wrote, by the way. Cause, oh, know, I see. Yeah, it's like, sometimes in acting, you take on stances or certain mannerisms for characters when you play them. Do either of you have particular stances or physical mannerisms that come out when you're playing different characters? Logan, uh, mostly for NPCs or Ajisai or like current characters or even past ones and me obviously for my, my current ladies. Oh. But I just thought this might be interesting to touch on because I know I have some. So I was like, I wonder if Logan has any that like you I... kind of fall into like certain placements in your body. So if we're talking about like legitimate physical like ways to hold your body, um, when I know a character's, like, physicality is a big part of their performance, I know I do a lot more, like, large gestures with them. Like, I do a lot of, like, shoulder rolling and, like, mm -hmm. neck movements whenever I'm doing stuff with them just to kind of keep engaged. Uh, but honestly, uh, I, I, I think I do, but I don't know what all of them are because they, they just happen. Yeah. Um, and I know that I, in the moment, catch myself doing shit with my body to stay in certain characters, especially any time multiple of my characters have to talk to each other like if I'm DMing and NPCs have to have a conversation with each other I know that I, I pretty directly get into like embodying them physically as I switch between voices because it helps to lock in where I am Yeah. Um, but uh, the one thing I do know and this is going to be kind of a really uninteresting answer is I know that depending on characters tension in my face tends to change wildly between voices uh specifically in how my eyes and my cheeks rest changes and i know that like doesn't in inform anything but um i a lot of how i like how i look at things if i was at a table i'm sure that when i play sterner characters i'd be it'd be a lot more evident um but, like, the way I look at things and the way mm -hmm. I let my eyes rest and the tension that I have in my, like, cheeks and whatnot shifts dramatically. I know when I play sterner characters, I actually tend to let go of a lot of the tension in my face, and I just don't blink as I'm portraying them. <laughs> because... Okay, I feel so seen because I do the exact same fucking thing. <laughs> I just started thinking about my girls, and I was like, I'm just making the faces where You're they right. sit in my body. <laughs> I know with Ajisai, I I do a lot more like stupid TikTok faces and whatnot as I talk. <laughs> like I do, I do a lot more like fucking fucking scrunching my mouth up all into one side and whatnot for when they're talking about things. Um, uh, but it, yeah, it it it's mostly facial. Um, but I also, as we know, when I GM and I play, I like to engage my standing desk and I like to stand. <laughs> I, I bet you if we put a camera on me, like my, my stance, how I ground myself, what I do with my hands probably changes dramatically. Because I know I do a lot of physical stuff, but I'm too busy doing what I'm doing to yep. ever clock what I'm doing. Um, and my background is primarily in like improv and such. So I mm -hmm. just like, I've learned to like not plan that stuff out as much as just let it happen as it's yeah. happening. So I... <laughs> It's a boring answer, right? Yes, but I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I the only reason I've noticed that I do it is because, like, I'll stop talking and then I'll notice my, like, hands are in a certain way or I'm like, bro, you can stop scowling. You're not talking anymore. <laughs> like, a lot of, like, I noticed I was doing it. Um, I mean, I started paying attention to it because of Carrie calling Brayden out about them, like, pantomiming picking flowers so my brain just started locking into, <laughs> do I do things? And I will, like, full disclosure, if Brayden and I are playing next to each other, we bitches are pantomiming so hard. <laughs> uh -huh, I imagine. But I'm like, Fina! I, um, mm. oh, I, I was talking to, sorry to interrupt you. It's all good. I was talking to Aaron the other day. Or no, it was Carrie. It was Carrie. So, like, I love our setup and I love how art-driven our stuff is. But if... If we all ever could be in the same place around the oh. same table, I would I would legitimately invest so much money into getting like a critical role esque setup because like the bare basics of it I I don't think would be all that hard no. to do. I'm not saying it would look 
yeah, obviously as good as the most well-funded show on the <laughs> internet. Uh, but I I do think we could do something that worked really well, um, both from a, a sound perspective and whatnot. And I I do there is a part of me that especially as time goes on and as I guess I enter my thirties. Uh, it, was, it might seem like a weird thing to say, but maybe I hope anyone in their 30s can like understand what I'm about to say. Like, I do think that element of being around a table and being able to gesture at each other and exist in the same space and like see each other's physical movements would be so good in like we'd, we'd have to sacrifice a little bit on the, the art side to have room for that. But like. Gosh, I just dream of being able to physically play vestige in the same space as people. You are not Stupid. alone on that. I I think about that a lot. Is I'm like I would love to be in a physical place because I've only played like a couple of table games and just the energy is so different. It's like yeah. it not to say that we have bad energy, but also I think it would help with like the Discord element that we deal with where we talk over each other. Oh, yeah. Just be oh, yeah. by the nature of how our show is run. And I'm like, something that even I'm like, might help, who knows, is turn on cameras, but not everyone's comfortable with that, you know? Mm -hmm. So it. No, I. But I, for like, for Vestige, you know? Never, I would, God, I would just love to play. With I all. don't, I don't. It's, uh, no, no shade to anyone that doesn't, and it huh. works for them. Uh, I don't like like individual camera games because no. it doesn't feel like being in the same space and it doesn't feel like looking at each other it feels like letting the audience look at you mm -hmm. but you, you don't have eye lines you don't have the same physical space you don't have the same lighting like all the things that i i want to get out of being in a physical space with somebody i i'm like i wouldn't still wouldn't get them like like i still wouldn't get if i was playing with somebody like, the idea of, like, their character's going through a hard time, and I'm beside them, and my character's trying to help them out. So, like, I physically take their hand because my character takes their hand. Like, there's yeah, no... Yeah, there's... You can't... There's no, no version of that. that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean more on, like, a private side, where it's just, like, just so we can see each other is more what I mean. I would never say for... Especially for our show, the way we run it, it's like, no, nah, I would never put, like, yeah. cams. I don't... I just don't think it works a lot of the time. My, my, my philosophy there, I guess, is if we can't get the full benefit of everything that would come with being at a table then why sacrifice the comfortability of the fact that some of us probably play in our pajamas yeah that's fair you know what i mean like exactly might as well like s fucking stop the pendulum at at one side of the swing don't stop it in mm -hmm. the middle no nah, i agree with that again Stances, right? That's what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, let me look at my fucking screen of questions to get yeah. myself back on track. <laughs> uh, I wrote a question here that I wouldn't mind asking uh, uh, personally. Ooh, okay. I'll finish answering this and then you can ask me a question. I'm done for that. All right. Here, my fucking, question yeah. is, uh, the host, how did you get so cute? Uh, faked it till I made it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> like, All right. Glad you enjoyed my contribution. Hip, hip, dip, dip. Uh, stances. Now I have to like think about it because a lot of it really is facial. I'm like, I'll just go down the list. Yeah. Uh, I noticed something that I do with Avi because I kind of caught myself doing it as I was like finishing talking is like when she gets like, if I'm like nervous with her, I'll be like kind of like playing with like my fingers or like I started like. I don't know if you can hear the thunder behind me, but I, can't. Uh, I started like anxiously playing with like the top of my forearms where like her feathers sit. And I noticed that that was like a tick that I would oh. do when I was playing her. Ooh. Like if she was nervous, I would like, I'll rub, I'll like sometimes like rub my neck where like her plumage sits there or like I'll play with like my arms. And I'm like, that's a thing she does. And it just made me go, oh, that's, that's an Avi tick is she plays with her feathers when she's nervous or when she's like anxious about something. It's usually when she's like talking about something more emotional. And I'm like, that's an interesting thing that I noted. So I've just kind of kept that in my brain. And it's just interesting. Uh, with Theo, it's a lot of facial stuff. I don't move my hands a whole lot with her outside. Of, like I'll, I talk with my hands. You've been in the same space as me. Yeah. Like I'll talk with my hands a lot. But, like, 
a lot of Theo, it's my eyebrows. It's a lot of high eyebrows, wide eyes, using my <laughs> entire just face with Theo. It's just, it's all this. And I'm like, the moment I started talking with her, I'm like, the hands are going and like the <laughs> eyes. Are, it's the I wide eyes thing. It's like, wah! She, she just brings out the wah energy and I love her. Oh, I, I guess an obvious yeah. one. And this is, uh, I guess, attack on is, um, and I think most GMs that even get remotely physically mm -hmm. involved technically do this. Uh, anytime I have to play anything bestial or any any sort of like monster or speak of them, I definitely do like a like a lizard man hunch when I'm doing stuff like that. I definitely like arc, arch my back and then put yeah. like my hands forward in like the T-Rex sort of bent arms raptory mm -hmm. pose, like, and then gesture <clears throat> that way, like stick the neck out so the neck's super long. Like anytime something like this has to happen, like it's it's just like a, a physical memory to be like, all right, I'm, I'm in lizard man stance. Let's go. Yeah. Here yeah. we are. It's kind of like, almost like muscle memory in a way. It's like by doing that, you can like get into it sometimes. I know that's kind of how it is for me. It's like VO, right? Yeah, like, exactly. You're, you're also, your body informs so much of the sound that's coming mm -hmm. out of your body. Like, I know when I play Avi, I'm usually seated back a little bit more and just like in a more like relaxed, like just kind of like chilling kind of way, like leaned back. Sometimes my, my leg will go up. I'm like, all right, we're just, this is, where we're at like regan there's not like a whole lot it's just kind of very chill and relaxed and just kind of because of like the breathy nature where her like voice landed um it tends to be like slow like if i end up using my hands like slower hand motions or like if she's like casting spells or things like that i notice that i'll like grasp like a staff in front of me almost mm -hmm. it's like or if she's like nervous that's almost like something that i started doing as if she's like holding on to her woodland staff like trying to like almost like talking around it it's like it's a lot of like shoulder and hand like motions it's a lot of shoulders like thinking about it like where I place her, it's a lot of shoulders with Regan. It's very, I'm like, I love that. It's just interesting. Stances are fascinating to me. Whenever we were uh, doing improv training, one thing that I internalized that I try to use anytime I'm like kind of emotionally stuck is uh, knowing where emotion lives in your body. Like mm -hmm. knowing where, like letting yourself at some point have like worked yourself into a place so you, you're feeling a thing and then paying attention to where the tension in your body goes when you feel that thing yeah because i find i find you can like uh, a, a very common one a lot of people has is like anger manifests in the forearms and hands so like there's a lot of people that if you tense your fists and your forearms a lot like you can work your body into a point where the tension in your body matches the way that it is when you're angry um or it literally evokes the feeling of anger. Yeah. Uh, I I use that fairly commonly. Like I know that whenever I'm doing like anger stuff, I start opening and closing my hands to try to like tense my tendons there because it puts me in that state a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I do that uh, not as much for VO as I really should actually, honestly, because it's a tool I have and I have more time to think about it then. But um, I do notice like whenever I'm playing, I'll just... I, I use my hands to like create tension or I try to find parts of my body that I know like emotions sit in. Luckily when you're playing D&D &D, though, like <laughs> at least in Vestige, um, a lot of the emotions you need as a GM are like anger, surprise, and uh, condescension because a lot yeah. of the time you're trying <laughs> to kill things and general baddies tend to have like, you know, only so many ways they communicate in combat. True. It's like you either got your megalomaniacs or you've got your lizard folk who, despite definitely losing the battle anytime, are like, we are going to feast on you and everyone you know. And then you hit them and they take the two damage that they can take and then they die. <laughs> then they but, you know, them. if bad guys didn't talk a big game, then they wouldn't be fun to kill. No. But, uh, fucking, that was a tangent on a tangent on a tangent. Fucking muscle memory and, like, knowing where emotions live in mm -hmm. your body. I find to be so useful, and I think people that are good at improving, I, I think less consciously, but I think they naturally evoke that. Like I think we naturally put tension into places that we know will give us what we want back. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, it's, it's very it's very useful. Anyone that doesn't get their body involved in their acting or their improv, I think, is cutting off most of where their emotional life lives, you know? Yeah, I was having a conversation. Um, we did, like, a VO panel. Um, gosh, was it, was it Momo? Yeah, it was MomoCon like, a couple of years ago. I was talking to Fred Tatashore. He and I were talking about how, like, we are fucking bobbleheads in the booth because he's best known for like <laughs> being he's like a really he's like the iconic voice of like hulk and bruce banner he's fucking amazing uh, nice also one of the nicest people i know you're not listening fred but hi i adore you you're wonderful but um he and i were talking about it's like our head will be on mic but our arms and the rest of our bodies are going fucking crazy <laughs> it's like around this the mic we're like we're on mic and we're not gonna move our head but everything else is doing the fucking macarena right like i i can't say the role because it the show hasn't come out yet but it's it's the one i always talk about that mm -hmm. i've been doing consistently for like a year and a half um there's a character a villain i play for a, a kid's show and um i'm not gonna say any of his lines obviously Yee. we're gonna call him uh jeff the big we're gonna call him <laughs> And uh, fucking, big, big. and just anytime he does anything, like he is the only character I've ever played, where it's hard for me to stay on mic, and I've had to readjust because there's been so many times that I just get so into him because all of his lines are just like, "Fucking, you cannot defeat Jeff the Big. I am the greatest villain who ever lived. The city is mine." Like he is just all over the fucking place, yeah. and he. His whole point is he does what he thinks a villain is supposed to be. So he's huge. He's like, he's like a really dialed down slash Gregelgord up version of Mega Mind, like yeah. in that regard. And he's the only character I've ever played where they're like, I think you were off mic for that, Logan. I was like, oh, probably. I was flailing. Like you're like, I normally, have no doubts. I'm sorry. Like it's just the, I get possessed by the character, and I'm like, sorry. I I. I was 20 feet tall for a second. I apologize. I understand that. I just started playing a character who is very wacky. They come out on Saturday. I'm very excited. This it'll by the time this episode airs, it'll actually no, it won't be out because it properly airs tomorrow. YouTube side, it'll be Woo! out. But uh, they are the most fun I've had with a character because they are big Gregel Gagor esque big energy, and I don't get to go there ever. And I'm having the best time, but I have to be so conscious about where I am because it is my instinct, especially because we're dubbing, to just be Flaley McFlaylerson and dance around the booth. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's uh, so fun just it, it, when it's a the character trap. just kind of possesses you. <laughs> it's so fun. And it's so like, oh, fuck, man. But the fact that VO, you have such a narrow cone, mm -hmm. you have to keep your voice in. I actually, it's, it's funny. These problems with this character led to me doing a sound check with uh, the company. Because they were like, we want to, we noticed your booth is like you know, a little bit not as good as it was before. And we've had some tech issues. Could we like to try it again? And I was like, I got a whisper room. So I'm all, I'm down for that now. Um, but we did a sound check to get around those problems and the, the engineer who, like, I, I've done stuff with audio engineers and stuff before, but this one was the most like, Hey, since we have time, we should play for like mic placement and stuff. And I actually figured out where my mic should be in my booth as opposed to where I thought it should be. Oh, hell yeah. And it was just such an eye opening moment of being like, Oh, I thought, I thought I had this down, but apparently like. It's way better if it's up here. But it just reminded me, as a voice actor, how narrow the fucking cone is mm -hmm. that you can talk into and still sound good. Such a technical thing. Yeah, heckin', that was a big thing. Uh, we'll get back to D&D &D questions eventually, chat. Right now yep. we're just talking VO, and that's fine by me. We knew what this would be with you and I. <laughs> but uh, with one of my VO coaches, Mick Wingert, whom mwah, I love you so much. You're wonderful, Mick. I know you're not listening, but love to you. Uh, he is like very much play with like your mic placement and where you are like in relationship like to your mic. Think about where you are in relationship to like somebody you're talking to. Like if you're like doing like a mental line, so to speak, and like you're checking like your pockets for like shit like that. He's like, allow yourself to get a little closer up on the mic. Don't like be like, what's up ASMR? Like don't be <laughs> licking the pop filter, but feel free to get a little close 
closer when you're doing your business, as he puts it. Don't be everyone in the 2010s on the voice acting (laughs) alliance. Yep. (sighs) Who remembers the voice acting alliance? We do. Yep, we do. (laughs) Uh, Let's see if we can remember stuff about our characters, though. Perfect Mm. segue. Seamless. Be proud of me, Spencer, out there. I can feel you laughing at me. (laughs) <laughs> that was the entirety of my episode with he and Aaron. It was great of me doing purpose. Like it just became purposefully shitty segues. Cause I was like, I don't know how to do, s- I don't know how to get into doing other oh, that's questions. Really neat. And speaking of the color purple, my <laughs> keyboard, a, a viewer used a purple keyboard to write the next question. Maybe. Maybe who fucking knows. <laughs> Rolling a dice. Ooh, it's for me. Oh. Okay, roll the dice. I'm like, I, I can't wait to, to be the one to ask it. I mean, give yeah. it to me. I'm like, I'm looking at him like, do I want to read this? Yeah, fuck it, this is cute. This is fun. I'll throw it in Wits and Crits for you. Okay, okay. And I'm going to read it like a voice actor on the VAA in 2012. Oh, God. Do it. So, Fionnula, <laughs> how serious are you in taking up Sebastian's offer to go international as a ballet dancer all over the world now that you've sort of outlined the relationship between yourself and Arden? Was the initial intrigue genuine, or was it a jab to get at Arden? <laughs> you just sent me through time, bro. Sophia and Yola, how serious were you in taking up <laughs> Sebastian's offer to go international as a ballet dancer all over the world now uh, that you've sort of outlined your relationship between you and Arden? Was the initial intrigue genuine or was it a jab to get at Arden? I guess, in short, are you still thinking about doing that? Is it something that Fia and Yola has even <laughs> thought about in a while? She really hasn't thought about it that much since because head empty, not a whole lot of brain space going on in there. It's the sound of dice clacking around. There's not a lot yep. happening. Um, most There was a part of her that was intrigued. She's like, oh, I didn't know I could dance. That's cool. Because she has very good control over her body. And, like, she's a dexterous little dancey bean. And I think, it, you know, that's just kind of how she'd be. But a big part of it was she was pissed at Arden. And she was... <laughs> while she's not smart she picks up on emotions really easily and she was picking up on this is gonna fucking bother him so i'm gonna (laughs) marile it up i'm gonna mimic kind of what marile does because i know that confuses him and kind (laughs) of gets under his skin and me taking interest in this boisterous dancer motherfucker is getting under his skin i'm gonna do more of that i'm gonna piss him off (laughs) <laughs> that was kind of the intent, and it worked. Um, she got what she wanted out of that. But she did, she was interested in, like, someone else kind of taking interest in, like, her skills, not in, like, a fight kind of way. Yeah. Um, so she she thinks Sebastian's neat. Uh, she's not really thought about him much because there hasn't been a whole lot of reason to lately. She mostly just kind of looks at what's in front of her and what just kind of sits in her feelings a lot she's very emotionally driven uh mostly because head empty only click clack um <laughs> only but... click clack heart the heart goes kathumpa yep and my feelings are doing something all right we're gonna focus on that but uh she thinks sebastian's neat and that's like no it's cool that he like knows what he wants to do i wish i could have a choice like that but I'm a sword, and we're, not, we're just going to live in that and how sad that makes me. But, you know, that's where she's at. But, yeah, mostly, fuck with Arden. And it worked. And it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It's too middle of the day for me to be yawning. Ah! And a stretch. What's and happening? Big stretch. Yeah. Welcome to the big stretch. Yeah, I did. Gonna roll the dice to see what question's next. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Log in. <gasps> let's, let's find out what, what question is gonna be for you, buddy. Bro. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Let's see, let's see, let's see. <laughs> this is fun. This is a fun one. Yeah. 
Uh, we all know the DM can only play so many characters at one time, and as talented as they are, can't Muppet-style perform scenes all on their own. Watch me. <laughs> but you can certainly try. Still... I forgot this was in here. I'm tickled. Uh, still, the question begs to be asked. If Rory and Tontia were to actually be able to talk, what are some of the surface level takeaways they might have about one another? <laughs> Huh. <laughs> Rory and Tantia. Such different beings. <laughs> so, um, I imagine that there would be some similarities to, like, how, like, Agisai sees Krusk. Uh, <laughs> in that I know that Tantia, if they were, they're forced to spend an amount of time around Rory. Yeah. They would probably get kind of enthralled in in picking at picking on him. Uh, I think that <laughs> so Rory <laughs> to Tantia that that one's pretty easy. He would probably relatively write her off as being problematic since Iocane is one of the, the the few guilds registered with the Dragon Dagger that is like they are the most barely operates within the law groups in the cities. Uh, they, they would absolutely be like, ah, oh, fucking I okay. Like, you caused so much undue property damage. Um, they would probably end up having to, they would take away from Tantia that they, they probably would be like, well, you clearly set Aviana a great deal back in their emotional journey. <laughs> you are not a good influence. But also, you make sense. Um... As for Tantia, what they would take away from Rory, they'd probably, they'd probably get it. I mean, especially because if Tantia doesn't fully understand why they they and Aviana separated, um, she just accepts that it had to happen, but she doesn't like, she to this day doesn't get what happened. Mm -hmm. um, so to spend an amount of time around Rory would probably be a bit of a revelation for Tantia uh, in that it would be like, oh, okay, if this is what sticks, then that makes a whole lot of sense <laughs> that I didn't stick because I'm not this. Um, but if we're, like, looking outside the context of, like, you know, their shared quality, which is Aviana. Yep. <laughs> um, Jeez. I hate to say that Tantia just wouldn't have much interest in someone like Rory. He'd probably I mean, just be a, be a guard. You know what I mean? Like, he might as well be an NPC in her world. Uh, and likewise, Rory would probably broadly dismiss her as just being a problematic Dragging Dagger guild member. Yeah, that's fair. Honestly. It's like, it's, unfortunately, both of them are the yeah. kind of people who, like, they would put the other one in a box, and unless they had to spend a lot of time around them, they'd probably be like, you are easily summarized as this. No, that's super fair, because I'm like, especially when you take out the context of, like, there's another question that, like, you said something that I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you that, because I'm, I'm <sighs> curious, because I'm a nosy bitch, because that's why I have this show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't come here right. to be asked questions, to be interrogated, Well, too fucking bad, that's why you're here. <laughs> I just showed up looking to have a good time with my tiny capybara pal. That's what everyone comes here to do. They come here to think, they think that it's just going to be hanging out. Nah, interrogation sorry, time, buddy. baby. But yeah, like, because uh, something that, like, makes me think is, like, the party was a lot of tension and weirdness and honestly not so much for like Tantia in regards to fucking Rory but I'm assuming there was a lot there for him in regards to Tantia and you can correct me if I'm wrong but this is just outside perspective uh because he had just found out it's like oh that's who you okay cool yeah that okay cool there were a, there were a lot of moving pieces that made Rory um uh, let's call it uncomfortable at that just because mm -hmm. like the, they they were getting to know who the highest standard were more closely so like the highest standard interacting with them in general was like please go away just i just <laughs> want to do my job I'm, we're not friends i had no point 
I had no point welcomed this into my life. Go away. Um, and yeah, they they had a general understanding of Iocane because Iocane has something of a reputation within the city, but because Rory is a uh, a platinum district, they're a member of the Platinum Watch. Uh, they never had to really deal with them. They don't deal with a whole lot of like guild members because a very small amount of uh, Dragon Dagger registered guild members actually operate in the Plat Platinum District. Mm -hmm. um, so them having to like them meeting Tantia, them understanding who they are was both a uh, conflation of the reputation and also of like I'm not I'm not even gonna think about. The to be fair. <laughs> it's not that they decided not to think about it. It's at that point in their life they they weren't aware that they were they weren't aware that they were thinking about it. They were very much in a phase of like I don't fucking obvious. It's it's not I have fucking I I want to be with Avi so fucking you make me uncomfortable. It's that's not the form of the words in his head at yeah. that point. Um again <laughs> although Oh. There was probably, I mean, we never really touched on it because we don't. There was probably a period of Rory's internal life where there was likely a period of disappointment that came from like, oh, you were you were with a woman. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Uh, All right. It's like, oh, it you probably, like men too great. <laughs> yeah, it's like it probably wouldn't have been like a conscious thing, but like the immediate assumption is like, oh, all right, so I... I don't know why I'm unhappy about that. It's like, it's a very co mm -hmm. complex thing, right? Yeah. Like, um, like, you haven't analyzed it too deeply, so, but the emotion is there. As a, as, as a, as a, as a man who has been mostly interested in men for the purposes of dating, it, with my weird caveat as to who I am, um, so sorry, interested in women for the purposes of dating. I was Freudian confused. Slip. But Freudian I'm, I'm slip. Let it go. Sorry, sorry. No, for, um, a man who's been mostly <laughs> interested yeah. in women for the purposes of dating. Um, there have definitely, there's definitely been like a couple of relationships because obviously I am not like ever going to be like, oh, you're into, you're you're gay. Ooh, that changes how I feel about you. Mm -hmm. But there have definitely been, especially in my high school years, like people I've been interested in who, when I found out, they were like they were dating another woman. Um, it was like, I'm not upset, but I am unhappy at the implications that that leaves me with, you know? Yeah. And I imagine Rory felt a similar sort of like, oh man, well, I mean, it's not about me, so why why am I upset? You know, like I don't, I don't care, I think. Why do I care? I imagine Rory's very much the type who have been would have tried not to analyze yeah. that and would have just stayed in like, hmm. hmm. Is that weird that I'm upset? Why am I upset by this? Yeah. God. The whole fucking party was so fucking tense. I felt tense that whole time. I was like, Ugh. Yep. <laughs> what did I do? Oh, oh I love fucking, it. Fucking oh, summer grass arc. Oh, summer grass arc. Do you, the the campaign one of <laughs> Vestige is like so. If anyone ever is like fucking, have you ever get the impression that I'm like railroading anybody, or you think that I'm like, ooh, Logan's making his story happen <laughs> the way he wants? I promise you, I did not expect the Crystal Queen to ever be a part of you know campaign one, as it were. Honokuni was supposed to be, if it ever came up, was supposed to be way in the fucking future, like campaign three. Uh, I sincerely did not, I did not care if they were going to be in the glass crown. In fact, if they missed the date, the glass crown was going to be a thing happening in the background that would have influenced the politics of the city, but they wouldn't have been involved with. Um, I didn't necessarily count on them going to the cauldron quite so early, oh. and these, these, I mean, the cauldron was also supposed to be, like, way future thing, but then, uh, Izzy was like, I want to make a Warforged, and I was like, well, um, the best <laughs> hook I can think to give is to tie it into some stuff I would have probably later done. I'm gonna be totally real. Yeah. A lot of the stuff with the cauldron, um... 
So we're planning interim games, right? Like, we're planning mm -hmm. after this campaign's done, we're going to do some, like, smaller games between to, like, do more stuff in the world. The Cauldron probably would have been, like... Without the addition of Flux, it probably would have been a thing I might have even done with a different group of characters. Uh, like, I I am so genuinely, like, sure, once we're in a place, obviously, events unfold in a certain yeah. way. And I, as a GM, am insinuating that things should go down a certain path and the players tend to roughly follow it because as players, you know, we're here to play D&D, &D, right? Mm -hmm. um, but all the major set pieces and everywhere that we've gone in what is campaign one of a vestige i'm like i uh did not expect i kind of expected um everything to go i'm sorry that i've hijacked the, no, the podcast it's great. uh so i what about. i what i quote unquote expected of campaign one was everything up to murkwire was like in the the fight in the vault i mean then i expected that the party would maybe have investigated the loss of like souls and whatnot in the city which mm -hmm. i'd been like leaving clues about since like even i think as early as like session 15 or something um and uh i expected that they might have gone and like tried to fuck with the tenebros in kind of their own way and not have it be a thing that coincided with the arena but then i totally expected that after that it would be like okay off to do the pilgrimage you know, like I, I yeah. sort of in my mind, I was like, as soon as they're done in Summergrass, the key thing I expect that they'll be able to point themselves at is either hunt down Constelliquaries, which is a very vague thing, right? Like yeah. where where could they be? Um, do work for Morian, which may have pointed them at the cauldron, or uh, do Vogan's um, do oh, Vogan's gosh. thing pilgrimage, which I was like, I'll probably take them to Grey Rock and the land away, and then probably like back down to the Itonian capital. I don't know. It's fucking, we'll, we'll probably do that. And then the way the things unfolded, because Flux showed up when he did, his information was delivered into the, 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 the web of information. And I am very driven. My, my storylines are very, very driven by who finds out what and when. Like NPCs, the way I run them, um, I have a very opportunistic mindset characters are very about like changing and adapting and not just being like my plan is to revive the dark one and that's the entirety yeah. of who i am like like diane changed her goal twice because she had to because of information presented by the players mm -hmm. but flux's information coming in and the insinuation that tenebros is connected to flux caused um diane to inadvertently find out about the cauldron and then the desperation of the situation and the obvious fact that she wasn't going to win the election, which, you know, the writing was on the wall as of the attack on the, oh, yeah. the, the, the tournament. It's like any anyone could have seen that that was not going to go the right way. Um, also, Tenebros told her, hey, by, by the way, after the election, I'm going to fuck things up. You should leave and I'm going to impersonate you because it'd be funny. So she was like, <laughs> you know, I believe you. So... Um, but, like, then she went off to do that, and it became this thing of campaign one kind of became about... It opened with Edrigan and Diane sending the party on their first mission. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so it looks like what campaign one is going to be is closing the loop that is Diane's manipulation of events. Like, I know that's a very broad theme, but it wasn't supposed to necessarily be the thing. Um... And but it seems like the the ultimate spine of campaign one, barring like Honokuni, mm -hmm. is the world and the party responding to Diane's influence on the yeah. passage of events. And even if it doesn't seem like that sometimes, it kind of is, even though it she was an is. ally technically yeah. at different points, like Diane has been an integral like element that's weaved in and out. She supplied information on the family. She told them what Merkwire was up to. Uh, she was an ally briefly. She then became a secondary antagonist when she wanted to become the High Lord. Uh, and then she's the impetus that sent them out to the cauldron and whatnot. And even now, the current issue... I'm really going off on a thing. No, it's fine. Uh, um, Because I think about this a lot. I think about, yeah! like... I don't, no, I, I, don't, I, I don't try to... I don't try to force themes, but I'm yeah. like, the the connective tissue is, even now, Diane, 
she's still she's being opportunistic with them and being opportunistic. She came here to find the like Warforged vaults so that she could raise a small army and then like earn her position back through that and what have you. But then she came here, realized that's not what was happening, found something much bigger, and as the other side has discovered, slight spoiler, she is even complicit in a possible order to not only betray the family, which you guys all know at this point, she's effectively mm-hmm. abandoned the family. Yeah. Uh, but she is also, as the others found out, aware that the frame built are going to, they're going to be sent a signal to betray the family members they've been working with here at some point. And the one that told them that told them like Diane's aware of this and yet she's continuing to do what she's doing. So okay. it's it's this the the background like fucking story of this whole thing has been in, almost entirely driven by Diane adapting to the situation but her adaptations are always enough of a threat that the party's trying to catch up to it, to them. Um which is why I'm kind of like I I'm super like I think campaign 1 the the final thread closing regardless of how it closes is campaign one ends quote unquote when diane's plan to manipulate edrigan finally sees its ultimate conclusion mm-hmm. in her failure or success here you know what i mean yeah it's also i i like to i like to think that things have you know and that that things bookend and i'm like it began with edrigan and diane and it should hopefully end with the efforts of Diane, he says, trying to loosely construct a narrative theme out of the, <laughs> out of the strange convergent elements that have been put in front of him. It's fine. Heck, and we got time for one more question. I really went off. I'm sorry. It's all good. It's also, I'm looking at the time. I'm like, I have a session to get to. So I'm going to ah. ask one more question. We'll see who it's for. I'm like, I had a question for him. I'm like, I could jump on that, but we'll, we'll see. If it lands on you, I'll ask the one that I was looking at. Okay. Well, it landed on you. <laughs> Woo! So about Diane. So, so about so Diane. Like... Let's see, let's see, let's see. Where's she's such question? a, it's so fascinating to me because she doesn't even want to be an antagonist. No, she's just doing her thing. She's she's just con- she's trying to survive, and you guys maybe hopefully will understand more of that soon. But like her her whole everything she's done has been a situation exploding, and her being like, "What is the best way to clean this up?" But anyways, what's the question? But anyways, this is to wind way way back to another question. Woo! I say way way back because yo went you went off for a minute, which is fine. I'm so which, sorry. No, no, no. Don't apologize. It's my favorite thing so far about having like both you and Aaron on is you both do it and I love it. Cause I just sit here and go, Yes, tell me more words. Yay. No, go off. Tell me words. I love it. That's what I'm here for. I want the tea. Which is why I'm like, nah, I don't care if I answer that many questions. I wanna know about you, baby boy. <laughs> but um so we recently learned about how Aviana broke things off with Tantia. <laughs> What was Tantia's reaction to finding that Aviana had left and just been like, here's a note being like, hey, I'm leaving. And here's a feather that fell out because I'm fucking dramatic. Uh, What was kind of her reaction to finding that her girl had broken up with her basically via text? Via ye old text. (laughs) Ye old Um, text because Avi's a fucking coward. It is not thou. Tis I. Tis I. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, though. Um, their reaction... So my understanding of their relationship is that... Um, and hopefully this doesn't contradict your uh, understanding of their relationship too much. I think we pretty uh, much nailed down kind of where they were, though. So. Is that it wasn't like a highly necessarily emotional re- relationship that it was... A good deal of it was physical, mm-hmm. um, but that a lot of it was, like, circumstantial and was a very, like, camaraderie and combat high sort of driven relationship that was, like, heckin' compatible people were in a, a space where they could exist simultaneously and enjoy each other. And, like, it's not that it was not emotional, but uh, it was largely, like, fun. Yeah. And I think that the ending of the relationship... Tantia probably internalized that in the same way that Iocane members in general tend to see everything as we could die like literally in 10 minutes. So 
what is life? Until the other's in danger, I will note. Until the other mm-hmm. one of them is, like, close to death, at which point both Argo and Tanji are like, no, life has stakes, I'm gonna murder somebody. But, um, I think that whenever Tantia uh, found the, the letter and was broken up with, I think largely their reaction probably would have been as, un, as, as dismissive as this sounds, um acceptance that they were no longer fun in the way that kept Avi's attention. Um, They didn't understand why, and I think that part of the problem with that would have come from that Tantia isn't looking for the (laughs) same kind of emotional validation in a relationship that I think Avi ultimately is. Um, even their relationship with Fenris, like, she's super duper about Fenris, but their relationship progressed very quickly, and that's largely to do with Io Kane's live or die, like, like, fucking die or ride attitude, and also with the fact that Tantia is like, this seems like it will be fun, and I can emerge emotionally from that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, I, I think that it would have been disappointment, and then probably would have gotten lost somewhere in the combat high of whatever suicidal mission they whatever would have she gone was doing on next at the time. Yeah. Although I will note, uh we had talked about the fact they went off adventuring together. Iokane and uh well Iokane, uh mm-hmm. in the in that it was at least Argo and Tanti and Aviana at that point, possibly others depending on the timeline. I can't remember exactly. I don't remember. Um, I don't remember if Blister and Fume were still Blister with them at that point. I think Fume were. I think it was just the trio. Yeah. Um, just... They they were adventuring away from Summergrass at the time, and but the, the story behind that ultimately is that it was during a period where Argo was still trying to track down information on the Crystal Queen, and they were doing jobs across the country to, like, look for that. The reason that they are back in Summergrass as of the game... Um, so pre-Avi existing and post-Avi existing are slightly different answers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pre-Avi existing was that they had hit a dead end and they returned to like build up their finances and whatnot again so that they could go out. Uh, however, post-Avi existing, um, the reason that they're back in Summergrass is largely due to the fact that um, they wanted they, they sort of lost steam that Tantia sort of lost steam out in the, the adventure and didn't come back to look for Aviana necessarily, but didn't not come back mm-hmm. to look for Aviana necessarily. They came back because it was familiar territory and also to rebuild their finances and such before they went out again. Um, so I think the fact that Tantia is in Summergrass is a lasting effect of having been broken up with in yeah. a way that didn't offer much closure. Well, they they came back to what was familiar. <laughs> yeah. Javi tried to give, not successfully, because even then she's like, she didn't say the main reason is that, like, until she talked to Fenris, until Fenris, like, confronted her, it was like, hey, so what happened? It's like, oh, okay, we can talk about this. All right, cool. And you're going to pull out that I had really deep feelings for her and I was scared of them. Yep. <laughs> so I fucking cheesed it. <laughs> Um, she won't, she wouldn't even have written that down. It's like, I got shit to do. Not finding what I need. I'm not going to go into more than that. Goodbye. <laughs> I don't know how to feel with, with about my feelings. Dear Tantia, <laughs> I left the oven on. Goodbye. Goodbye. She doesn't know how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's why she left the oven on. <laughs> True. Uh, well, I don't, didn't leave an oven on. I do have things to do when you have things to do. So that is all the time we have for today. Even though I'd be like, we could go for a three hour heckin' wits and crits. I don't give a crap. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Why am I censoring myself? I'm not Regan today. But I was Hayden today. I and, don't give a Logan, snip snap. I don't give a snip snap. And Logan was, I don't know, Adam Conover? Maybe. Who knows? Yeah. But thank you guys so much for listening. Logan. Thank you so much for being on with me and chatting so much and being on tangents and being such a good sport about being like, hey, there were a lot of ship questions that the dice actually just landed on. So thank you for indulging Honestly, me. as a GM, 
I fear worse when a QA opens. I f- mm-hmm. there's certain questions that I'm like, like how do you, how did you do this particular like, what is what is your, what are your thoughts on this economic system there? It's like I, there are, uh, God, there's a council that runs the city, and they handle it. It's like, oh, cool. So what's the system that of like the Nephilim? Like how do you handle like how do you build their society? There's a council I that runs it. the city. <laughs> like it's yeah. It's, it's a lot, a lot of feudal things. It's like there are people that handle it. A lot uh, of the questions that we got were a lot more just emotional based, which I was really pleasantly surprised about. Oh yeah, no, I love these kinds of questions. Yeah, I'm glad. But where can people find you, my boy? Uh, you can find me well here. Um, yeah, on he lives the here Twitch, now. The Twitch that this is a rerun on. Uh, and also on the Let Them Play Games YouTube channel, uh, my Twitter, for as long as Twitter exists, is uh, the Azure Crow, all one word. My, uh, and then obviously you can find the sum total of most of my online presence on the Project Mouthwash channel, where uh, we do our uh, abridged stuff and whatnot, which is a core facet of a lot of us, our stuff. Um, Logan Layla on Drive Through RPG. If you want to go look up our stuff there, um, and heckin, we got a bunch of heckin platinum bestseller stuff. You want to go check that out? I recommend you do. If you're a new listener and you've somehow made it to like two and a half hours into this without understanding anything that's going on, then thanks for sticking around. Uh, go buy product. <laughs> um, and uh, that is. Largely where you can find me, Heck I think. Yeah. Well, uh, also, I'm, if you're on Blue Sky, for those of you that are on there, I'm also on there under the same there. name. You can find same. me. Just just look for Logan Layla on Blue Sky. You'll find me. Hickety heckin, y'all know me. I'm Hayden Davio. Uh, I'm on Hay. I'm Hay Bell Voice on literally all social media platforms, unless it's my VTubing, which is still Aria. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I am sorry that I am rushing to wrap this up because a recording booth is calling my name. Uh, but I love you guys so much. If you guys want more Nat 19, remember you can tune in Monday through Wednesday for gaming streams and off. Wednesdays you'll find Wits and Crits. Thursdays we have alternating D and D games, Princes in the Apoc- Princes of the Apocalypse, and Devils Might Surrender. And of course Saturdays we have Vestige of a Fucus. So thank you guys so much for watching. We will see you next time. We outies. Mwah. Mwah.